All right. <clears throat> so today uh, we're going to go over section 2.5 on problem solving. Uh, this is problem solving um, in relation to applications. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, we're going to review the five steps for problem solving. It's like a recommended sort of step-by-step uh, step pro step step process to solve equations. Um, and then we're going to be going over percent increase and percent decrease problems. Um, <clears throat> there's going to be quite a few in the middle that we're going to be using other formulas for, so you'll see what, what that means when we get there. <clears throat> All right, so the five-step problem solving method. Uh, if you guys want to look this up, um, <clears throat> oh actually, so this is on page 112, right? And then 113, there's a whole nother set of instructions uh, that has to do with becoming familiar with the problem. Um, so up here, we'll just go over the five steps for solving the problem, but I would highly recommend you guys go through the steps to becoming familiar with the problem too, because uh, a lot of times that could be the hardest part, right? Like once you're familiar with the problem, you know what equation you're supposed to use, like the rest is, is not that bad in comparison. <clears throat> so the five steps for problem solving in algebra. Number one is to familiarize yourself with the problem. Uh, this means like you look up related formulas and equations, uh, you pick out variables, you know, uh, you might uh, define variables yourself if there's an unknown that the problem is asking you about. Uh, in the second step, translate. We take all those things that we wrote down in the first in the first step and we kind of uh, use them to create our equation, right? And so we typically write a sentence out of what exactly the problem is asking for and then translate that into mathematical language. <clears throat> step three, we carry out the mathematical manipulation, otherwise we solve it. Uh, check your answer. That's important with any problem and we want to state the answer clearly using a complete English sentence. Uh, that's not something that I'll be doing too often on my examples. And I probably won't ding you too much for it on the homework, but you should get used to stating your answers in a sentence. Um, you know, Colleen might be more of a stickler than I am about it. Uh, I know most math teachers probably are, uh, so maybe I should get more strict on it. But <clears throat> so it's good to state your answer in a sentence. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's go ahead and go to this first example with this five-step process. So. In 1957, at the age of 69, Emma Grandma Gatewood became the first woman to hike solo all 2,100 miles of the Appalachian Trail from Springer Mountain, Georgia to Mount Katahdin, Maine. Gatewood repeated the feat in 1960 and again in 1963, becoming the first person to hike the trail three times as, three times as far, whoops, hike the trail. Uh-oh, looks like I might have skipped a portion in the, uh... <laughs> Aha, I did. Hold on. Let me, let me add this portion in real quick. Because <laughs> that's the crucial part. Trail. <laughs> okay. At... Whoops. Um, oh no. At Big Walker Mountain. Okay. At Big Walker Mountain, <clears throat> Gatewood was. <laughs> she was three times as far from the northern end of the trail as from the southern end. So, sorry about that, guys. That was a little weird. Okay, so basically this says that it gives us a ton of information we don't need uh, and right at the end it says, okay, so this lady walks a trail. Um, at a certain point, she was three times as far from the northern end of the trail as she was from the southern end. At that point, how far was she from each end of the trail? All right, so let's familiarize ourselves with this. Um, first of all, I like especially with distance problems involving segments, I like to draw a little uh, diagram. So we'll consider this the north end. Consider this down here the south end of the trail. And we'll say this point right in the middle is where she's at. 
Okay. So let's see now. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do first is we want to figure out what our unknowns are. Um, so right here, this last sentence, when they say, how far was she from each end of the trail? That's an indicator that those are going to be variables, right? They ask us the question about that distance. So that's going to be our variable, right? So let's say, so let's say, let D equal, uh, the distance from the south end. Whoops. Sorry, distance, not difference. <clears throat> okay, so if D is the distance from the south end, we can label it right here on our graph or on our diagram. All right, so then um, since the problem says right in it, <clears throat> Gatewood is three times as far from the northern end of the trail as from the southern end. Well, if D, so let's see now, how do I say this? <clears throat> so let's see now. So this is basically saying that the northern side is three times the size of this southern side, right? And so this is 3D. And so kind of like what we're doing here is we're like, um, we're sort of naming one variable and we're defining the other variable based on that. You know, uh, it, would be, it would be easy when we're writing this trail to just have two different variables, like you know, maybe x on the northern end and y on the southern end. Um, but that's not really, you know, they gave us enough information to where we don't need that. We can break it all down to one variable. And a lot of these problems, that's what it's all about. They'll give you like a standard, um, value like they did D in this one and then they'll give us another value related to D and so we can kind of name those as our variables okay so oops step one came first in those <laughs> I screwed this lecture all up guys so this is supposed to be translate all right so we just familiarized ourselves we named the variables uh, now let's go ahead and translate. So what, what they're asking us uh, in this problem, or I guess the sentence that we're going to use, right? We're saying, <clears throat> we're saying that these two ends combine to create a total distance, right? So we're going to say the distance to the southern end plus the distance to the northern end is equal to the total distance. Oops, that should be is. Okay, so distance to the south end, we name that D. Distance to the north end, we know that is 3D. Is, that translates to equals, and the total distance they gave that to us right here, 2,100 miles. Okay, so now, now that we're done with step two, we've translated into an equation. Now we're going to carry out, and that just means solve the equation. So D plus 3D equals 2,100. That means that 4D is also equal to 2100. Right? On this step, we want to multiply by the reciprocals, or in other words, divide by the coefficient. And that gives us d equals some nice number, probably 525. All right. So that one, I don't know. I actually had to sit down and think that one out just because there's so much introductory stuff to it, you know. And, and like I said before, this is what they like doing to you, you know. I mean, they give us a whole paragraph worth of stuff, and we use like one number and the end sentence, and that's it. Uh, so keep in mind, they like to do that to you. There's a bunch of numbers in here that don't really matter. Um, you know, it's kind of like a classic trying to confuse you problem. All right, so let's do another example. 
this example, um, so the first problem type that we did, uh, that was like a total distance problem. And so like one leg of a journey plus another leg of a journey equals both legs the total distance. Um, this next example, this is what we call a consecutive integers problem. And there's one thing that's really important to remember if you're going to be successful at consecutive integers problems, right? So consecutive integers look like this. Suppose we have an integer n. The next integer is just going to be n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 3, right? Like that's just the concept behind these, right? And so they'll give you a number and they'll say, okay, we have a number and the next consecutive number. Well, those two numbers are n and n plus 1. Right? If they're asking you for consecutive odds, right? then you'd say, okay, n, and then n plus 2. Right? And so that's kind of how you, how you use those as formulas. So let's do an example. So the interstate mile markers. Uh, U.S. interstate highways post numbered markers at every mile to indicate the location in case of an emergency. The sum of two consecutive mile markers on I-70 in Kansas is 559. Find the numbers on the markers. Okay, so familiarize ourselves. First of all, we recognize that this is, this is a consecutive integers problem. That's one of the first things about familiarizing yourselves. Second, uh, there's not a whole lot of pre-stuff to do on this, so we'll just go ahead and name our variables, right? So they want us to name the numbers on the markers. So we'll choose one number. We'll say let n represent the smaller number. Then, oops, and we don't even need to define the next one. We already know that n plus 1 is equal to the next number. Now, if we wanted to, uh, and, you know, yeah, just if we wanted to, there's an alternate way to set this problem up, uh, as there are for a lot of these problems. If we wanted to, we could have said, we could have said, uh, let n equal the larger number. And then we would say n minus 1 is the smaller. Right? But we don't choose to do it this way this time, so we're just going to wipe this out. It would be the same kind of solution. Uh, you know, you get the same exact answers. Your problem would just look a little bit different. Okay, so now we named our variables. Uh, now we just want to translate, right? So this says the sum of two consecutive mile markers uh, on I-70 in Kansas is 559. So what this is saying is... One number plus the next number is 559. So n plus n plus 1 is equal to 559. Whoops, 559. <clears throat> okay, so the next step, let's combine like terms. And we have 2n plus 1 equals 559. If we subtract 1 from both sides, then we get 2n equals 558. And then if we divide both sides by 2, we get n equals, I don't know, I think I wrote it down somewhere, 279. Thank you very much. 279 is what n equals, right? And so that means, so n plus 1 is equal to 280. Real quick, let's go ahead and check our work. 280 plus 279, that in fact equals 559, so we've, we've got our two numbers. Oops. So I carried out a step early. <laughs> I got a little excited. I also checked two steps early, you guys saw there. And ah, I state, so how do I state this one? Let's go back to the original problem. Okay, the sum of, okay. We would say, mm -hmm -hmm. no, 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 let's see now. The, uh, 
uh, I guess you would say the mile markers that sum to 559 are, are 279 and 280. All right. So that was it. For consecutive integers, just remember, just name one integer n and build off of that. All right. The next one, photography. It was kind of like a budgeting problem. <clears throat> so there's this person named Maris Marissa, and she has a budget of $500 for photographs. I'll highlight that. For photographs of her company's new website. Several friends have recommended fine taste photography for the job. Marissa has learned that fine taste charges $125 per day session plus a fee for each Im image used. She has gathered the following data. Why she can't just call these people up and ask them how much it costs per picture? I don't know. <laughs> so we figure out the rate. Whoops. We figure out the rate by using division. So <clears throat> let's see now. 60. How does it go? So 65 divided by 2, that is equal to 32.5 for this guy. 650 divided by 20, again, that's equal to 32.5. And then there's this last one, 780 over 24, that's equal to 32.5 again. So what we learn from this is we're paying 32 dollars and 50 cents per picture. All right. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and familiarize ourselves with this. So we have $500 as a base, or no, that's her budget. Uh, $125 as a base for the day. And then we have 32.50 per picture on that day. Okay. <clears throat> so the question, the actual question asks, from the information given, how many images can she buy without exceeding her budget? So we see right here how many images. That means the number of images is going to be one of our variables. So we're going to let x equal the number of images. All right. So we've named all our variables. We've written down all our related prices and numbers. Um, we figured out our rate. So now it's safe to translate. <clears throat> so we're actually translating. <laughs> Something similar to this guy. $125 for a day session plus a fee for each image used uh, must be less than 500 her total budget. Okay, so. Oops. Sorry about my writing. Okay, so 125 day session plus 32.50 times the number of images, getting ahead of myself here, is $500. Sorry, I got ahead of myself on that one there. Plus, um, cost per pick times picks. <laughs> That's still not much of a sentence, but oh well. Okay. <laughs> so uh, $125 for a day session, $125, that goes in there right off the bat. Plus is, of course, the addition sign. Uh, cost per pick times number of picks, well, that is $32.50. 32.5 times x 
because we determined x to be the number of picks. And we want how many picks can we take to equal $500. All right, so we translated it. Now we just got to solve it. So 125 plus 3250 x equals 500. So we solve it by subtracting 125 from each side. And it's going to give us 32.5x equals 3375. Then we're going to divide both sides by 32.5. This guy cancels, and then what do we get? What'd you get? Hmm? 11 and a half? 11.5. All right. So now we carried it out, right? Okay. X is equal to 11.5. Uh, then we want to check our work. So go back up to our original equation. You guys want to check that real quick on your own? Go ahead, check it. Let me know. Let me know. Is it correct or what? So the answer we got was 11.5. Tell me if that's correct or not. Anybody got a, are we correct? Are we not? Yes, no? Say it out loud. Kevin? We're correct. Huh? We're correct? We're good? All right, excellent. Thank you very much. We are correct on that one. <laughs> All right, so now we got to state our answer. <clears throat> okay, so we go back up to the original problem and see what are they talking about. So, all right, so we wanted Okay, so first of all, our answer is 11.5. Can we take 11 and a half pictures? Uh, no, not really, that's not gonna make any sense. Uh, so what we do, since we haven't been solving inequalities yet, but we will next chapter, uh, in this one, we're just gonna notice that you can't really take half a picture, and so um, we're gonna say this is gonna be 11, right? Because she can't go over her budget, so we're gonna budget under that, right? And so the state, all right, so, um, I can't remember her name, but I'm going to say Kim. Kim can take 11 pictures without going over her budget. There we go. It's all good. OK, next one. Um, so. In one of the previous examples, we did consecutive numbers, right? And for that, all you had to know was, well, start with the number n and then build off of that. Uh, for this one, we're dealing with perimeter, right? And the formula you need to know to solve perimeter problems is just this. The perimeter of any rectangle equals 2w plus 2l. And that usually takes place in the familiarization set, but... We're into it anyway. So the perimeter of an NBA basketball court is 288 feet. The length is 44 feet longer than the width. Find the dimensions of the court. So to familiarize ourselves with this, first of all, we just note real quick, well, we're going to use this equation, P equals 2W plus 2L. Right? And once you recognize, oops, once you recognize uh, the equation you're supposed to use, it becomes a little bit easier after that, right? So now we know that we just need to plug things in. We have P. We just need to plug things in for W and L. <clears throat> so it says right here, the length is 44 feet longer than the width. So that is saying, right, if we just write down the whole sentence, that is saying L plus 
44 is equal to W. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so now that we have that, this is our relationship between the two variables, right? And so in our next step, right, we'll take this perimeter equation and throw it down here, but we're going to rewrite it. So we're going to say P plus W can remain the same. 2W, whoops, not plus, sorry. P equals. P equals 2W plus 2 times L, right? Whoops, I did that the wrong way around. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> sorry, guys. So, <laughs> 2 times W first, right? But we know what W is equal to in terms of L. W is equal to L plus 44. So we're going to put in parentheses L plus 44. And then we just do 2L. So what we did there was we took this W from up here in the first general equation and we subbed it in for the relationship that we know exists between this W and this L. Right? And that allowed us to get rid of two variables and restrict it to one. And that means we can solve it. Okay, so the next one, translate, right? <clears throat> translate. Um, and so really we can just translate our perimeter uh, equation that we already have, which is perimeter is 2 times width plus 2 times length. All right. P equals 2W plus 2L. And then we can substitute in the values that we know we have, right? So we know that P is equal to 288. So 288, which is equal to 2W, but W is equal to L plus 44. And then we just have 2L, because L remained just the length. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and carry out the above equation, right? So we have 288, which is equal to, after we distribute this 2 in, we have 2L plus 44 times 2, which is 88. And then we also have a 2L kind of just trailing behind here. All right, next step, 288 which is equal to, now we have 4L plus 88. I'm going to go ahead and subtract that 88 from both sides. All right, these guys are going to go away. And we're going to get 4L is equal to 200. Divide both sides by 4 which is equivalent to multiplying by the reciprocal, and we have L equals 50. All right, so now we want to go ahead and check our answer, right? Okay, let's check it. <clears throat> so we had L equals 50. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh-oh, might have done something wrong here. Uh -oh. oh, okay. No, no, we got it. What's that? You have a question, Kevin? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry about that, guys. I was just trying to make sure that this was correct. We got it right. <laughs> okay. So L is 50, right? Um, and then W... W is equal to 44 plus L, which is equal to 94. All right, so all we need to do is say 2L plus 2W. What does that equal when we sub in our values? Well, that equals that equals 288, which is the value they gave us. So we're good. We're correct. <clears throat> All right. So perimeter problems 
first thing you should always think about is P equals 2W plus 2L. That's the magic formula for any kind of perimeter problem to deal with rectangles anyway, not triangles and other things. All right, let's go on to a different type of problem. The motion problem. <clears throat> so any formula to do with motion, uh, not any, but most formulas to do with motion use this simple principle. D equals R times T. It basically says distance is equal to the rate times the time. Okay, so the distance is equal to the rate traveled times the time traveled at that rate. Okay, so that's like, a, this is kind of just the basic distance formula that you should think of whenever you run into a distance problem. So let's do a motion problem right now. So Sharon drove for three hours on a highway and then for one hour on a side road. Let's go ahead and highlight these. Three hours and one hour on a side road. Her speed on the highway was 20 miles per hour faster than her speed on the side road. If she traveled a total of 220 miles, how fast did she travel on the side road? <clears throat> okay. So first things first. Let's familiarize ourselves with this. So uh, we just went over the motion formula, so that's a pretty good indicator. That's what we're going to use. Um, so we're just going to say motion d equals r times t. Okay. So <clears throat> for these types of problems, um, you know, you might not need to do this, but this is something that I kind of like to do. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and build a table for this guy, and this is going to kind of inform us of how we should construct the equation. This is going to be a lot more helpful in the algebra classes after this, but you might as well get used to it now. So on our table, I am going to list the two legs of her journey, the highway leg and the side road leg. Okay, because she went different speeds on both of those legs. Okay, so we're going to have to split those up. Up across the top, I'm just going to write the, the terms in the equation, the terms and the factors. So D, R, and T. Okay, so on the highway, it doesn't really give us a distance, so we're going to skip that for now. It gives us a total distance, but it doesn't break it down into legs. And so that kind of that's a pretty good indicator, like, you know, we're going to be adding two things to get a total here. Uh, but for now, we're going to leave the distance blank. So the rate on the highway, <clears throat> let's see now. Actually, let's just start out with the time column. That's going to make more sense with this one. So they gave us two times. So they said on the highway, she traveled three hours. On the side road, she traveled one hour. Okay, um, now let's go back up to the problem and see if we can find a value for R. I believe we can. So, in this sentence right here, it says her speed on the highway was 20 miles per hour faster than her speed on the side road. So, so we can say, Highway speed, we'll just let h equal highway speed, right? h plus 20 equals side road. <laughs> equals side road. I should probably make up some variables for those, honestly. Um, <clears throat> so what we can do, yeah, let's make up some variables for those. All right. So let r equal speed on side road. Okay, so R is equal to the highway speed H plus 30. <clears throat> Alright, so um, and I named the wrong variable I think. Uh, 30 please. All right. Does it say, oh sorry, 20. All right, so now we let R equal the speed on the side road, right? And so this is R, that's our variable. Um, <clears throat> we also know that uh, R equals H plus 20. Well, we kind of want H is our speed on the highway, right? But we want to replace that value for H. 
So in this little equation that we've created for r up here, we solve for h by subtracting 20 from both sides. And we get h equals r minus 20. So we're going to go ahead and sub that guy in. OK. So now, now we can actually do our little, uh, we can finish our equation for distance now. Um, so we had the total distance before, but now what we have is kind of like a substitute for the distance of each leg. Since the distance of each leg, let's say d1 for leg 1, is equal to r1 times t1. So for d1, we can say, whoops, r minus 20 times 3. And then for the side road, we say 1 times r. Does that make sense what I just did? OK. So now we translate. So what we want is, what we want, oh. Okay. So what we want is to say highway distance plus side road distance is the total distance they gave us up here, which was 220 miles. All right, so our highway distance, that was up here. That one is 3 times r minus 20 plus, it's just a plus sign, the side road distance, which is right here, which is 1 times r, or in other words, just r, is, is our equals sign and 220 miles. All right, so now we've translated it. Let's go ahead and carry it out. All right, so as we learned the other day, first we, what we want to do in these situations is get rid of our parentheses. We do that by distributing. So we're going to get 3r. Uh, 3 times negative 20 is negative 60 plus r equals 20. Okay, we're going to combine our like terms. That's going to give us 4r minus 60 equals 220. We're going to add 60 to both sides. It's going to get rid of the 60s over here, and we're going to have 4r equals 220 plus 60, which is 280. Okay, divide both sides by 4. And we get what? 70? All right, there we are. So 70. And so we, we said that R was the speed on the side road. Yeah, so we said R was the speed on the side road, right? So 70 equals 70 equals the speed on the side road and the side road, sorry, the highway. Shoot, I think I did this problem wrong. It's never anything you want to hear from me, right? I did do that wrong somewhere. Oh, I think we should have been using an x plus 20 for some reason. Yeah. Well, but it's weird. Darn it. Yeah. So I defined those variables the wrong way.
All right. So, <laughs> so what we did, that's interesting. Okay. Why we distance Yeah. Well, highway R plus 20. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're yes. <laughs> yeah, it says it right here. Highway was 20 miles per hour faster than the speed on the side road. That's where it went wrong. <laughs> right, and so I, I didn't start figuring that out until the bottom where I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. All right, we have a bunch of time, so I'm just going to go back and do this one. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Emily. <laughs> right? I know. Hopefully you guys won't do this on the test because even though you're forgiving on me, I'm not. On the... <laughs> we'll note that. Right? <laughs> no, you guys can go ahead and just, just yeah, let me have it for the instructor review. I don't mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, Emily, you're right. That was super embarrassing. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> to the bottom. Well, I know that some people are following. I know that some people are following out of their books, and they're like, "Wait, that was the wrong answer." And I'm like looking at my stuff, like, "Wait, I don't." All right. So anyway, yeah, the translation was completely wrong. Um, so we'll start back over from the carry out line. Um, so if we had translated it right the first time, then we'd have these two quantities, and we would have three times r plus 20 plus r equals, what was it, 220. Okay, so once again, distribute in here, we get 3r uh, plus 60 plus r equals 220, and then we get 4r plus 60 equals 220 still, uh, and we subtract 60 from both sides, and then we get 4r is equal to 140. One sixty, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good day today. I don't think it was a good day on Thursday either. Maybe I'm losing my edge. So there we go. Not that I ever had an edge. Um, so, <laughs> so we got 40 for that one, right? We count 20 back up to our highway speed, and we get 40 and 60, respectively. So um, what's her name? So the lady went 40 mph on side road and 60 mph on highway. There we go. <laughs> All right. Problem solving tips. Maybe I should look these up myself. <laughs> so see page 119 for some problem solving tips. There's like a little green box in the bottom. Uh, there are five tips. Um, you know, some, some of them uh, on 119, yeah. Yeah, and so there's a few boxes you can look back to when you're in your homework. Uh, my guess is this homework will probably be a little bit frustrating for most of you guys. Um, some oh, things that might help are the things in the green boxes. Look at this five. Make sure you have completely answered the original problem using the appropriate units. <laughs> I did use the appropriate units, miles per hour. Okay. On a side road? Uh, I don't know. Maybe she's a badass. Maybe I have no idea. <laughs> you know, maybe. Sharon. It's Sharon's on the side road. Oh, it was Sharon. She doesn't sound like a badass. All right. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> percent increase and percent decrease problems. Uh, the three key numbers to note when we're doing percent increase and percent decrease problems is the original amount before the change the amount of increase or decrease, and the final amount, or the amount after the change. Uh, when we have these types of problems, uh, there's usually three cases that these conform to. If you kind of recognize all three cases, it won't be a problem at all to do these. Um, so uh, case one, the amount of increase is added to the original amount to get the new amount. 
right? That looks something like this. Um, it's like, you know, uh, original amount, uh, some number plus x times some number. Actually, no, I won't try and do this. We'll just go over the cases. All right, <clears throat> the second case. <laughs> the amount of decrease is subtracted from the original amount to get the new amount. Uh, the third case. The percent increase or percent decrease is calculated on the basis of the original amount. Those are the three cases you will run into when doing percent problems. So let's do one and see what case we get. All right. Through diet and exercise, Gabrielle's weight decreased from 150 to 145 pounds. What was the percent decrease in her body weight? <clears throat> All right. This is an example of case three. So the original weight was 150. The new weight is 145. Okay. And so the percent change is X we don't have that yet. Okay, so All right. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So, so what we have here is the original 150, right, um, plus x times the original is equal to 145. Now, x is a negative, so don't worry too much, right? <clears throat> so now we've got x and we've got all our numbers. All we need to do is solve. So we have 150x uh, is equal to, sorry, I'm going to subtract 150 from both sides. Uh, 145 minus 150 is negative 5, right? 150, 150. And then we get out our handy dandy calculator. So this is 5 divided by 150. And we get 0 0.3, whoops, that's not it, 0 0.03 repeating. <clears throat> okay, so, and it's a negative. So this is our percent change right here, except for it's not in percentage yet. So how do we switch that to percentage? Boom, boom, move it two spots, and we get negative 3.3 repeating percent. All right. Did that one make sense to you guys? Okay. And so notice that we, we weren't allowed to just, you know, like we had to put this original amount in there twice, right? So keep that in mind. All right, let's do a different kind. So the tax-exempt Hope Food Pantry received a bill of $242.65 for food storage bags. The bill incorrectly included sales tax of 5.5%. How much does the food bank actually owe? Okay. <clears throat> so what we want to do is subtract the tax from the food bank, right? So the original is going to be the original bill, 240 2.65. The percent change, right, included, we want to subtract that. So the percent change is going to be negative 5.5. And the new, we don't know what that is quite yet. So we're going to call that x. <clears throat> okay, so um, to familiarize ourselves with this, uh, we sort of already did. Um, we just wrote down our little table here. We've got our variable. Um, we know that we're going to be using a decrease in percentage, so that's kind of familiarizing it. Um, translating it, uh, what we are saying is, <clears throat> um, hmm. uh, 
We were saying we want the original bill minus the sales tax is the new price. Okay, so the original bill, we know what that is. That's 242.65. Minus the sales tax, which is 5.5% of <clears throat> the original, right? 242. Am I doing this one wrong, too? Oh, it's been a long day, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am doing this one wrong. I totally am. Oh. Okay. Do you have a math book? No, I. You guys. <laughs> no, uh, I don't. Thank you, though, Kevin. <laughs> I think I need it next time, though. Okay, so we don't. <laughs> so we're going to go back and redo this. All right. I get an F, guys, for this particular class. Um, <laughs> so we're going to go back and redo this uh, table because they filled it out wrong, right? What we want to do is find the original price. <laughs> uh, the percent change uh, is going to be 5.5, uh, and the new price is the wrong price that they give us, 242.65. All right. <clears throat> So the original bill, I had the sentence right at least. It was when I started writing this sentence that I was like, oh no, you did it again, dude. Okay, so the original bill, X plus the sales tax, 5.5%, which is 0 0.055 uh, times the original is equal to the new price, which was 242.65. Is that right? Yes. All right. So now we go about solving this guy. Um, so we combine our like terms, which we get 1.055x is equal to 242.65. <clears throat> now we divide both sides by 1.055. And we get roughly... Two thirty. All right. So the original bill was about two thirty. Was exactly two thirty. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we've done enough checking for this one. We're gonna move on. All right. <laughs> Angles of a triangle. These are another problem type. Um, basically, and we'll go over this in the summary. But basically, like the secret to all these. Um, problem types is just, you know, recognizing what type it is and using the formula correctly and checking all your answers to make sure you don't m make mistakes like I did, right? You got to make sure that everything makes sense. <clears throat> <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> the second angle of an architect's triangle is three times as large as the first. The third angle is 30 degrees more than the first. Find the measures of each angle. So familiarize ourselves, right? So for any triangle, for any triangle, right, we'll say angle one, angle two, and angle three. Angle one plus angle two plus angle three is equal to 180 degrees. So that's what ties it all together for your triangles. <clears throat> so Let's relate the angles, right? Um, so, well, first, let's go ahead and hmm. okay. So let's say let angle one equal x. All right, and the the reason why I did that is because. Is because the first the first angle is kind of like what what is not really operated on in these sentences, 
So I just, you know, you can really choose any angle and build off that, but I just chose the first. So <clears throat> what we need to do is express the second and third in terms of the first. So the third angle is 30 degrees more than the first, right? And so we'll say angle three is x plus 30. Right, and so let's see now, what about the second? The second angle of an architect's triangle is three times as large as the first. So what does that mean? Do I say three X? Yeah. All right, there we go, right? Three times the first is equal to the second. All right, and so now, uh, there's not really a whole lot of translation here. Uh, we'll just translate our formula, angle 1 plus angle 2 plus angle 3 is equal to 180. All right, okay, angle 1 is just equal to x. Angle 2 is equal to 3x. And then angle 3 is equal to x plus 30. And all that's equal to 180. Okay. So now, we're going to carry this guy out, right? And drag it on down here. I'm going to combine like terms. That's going to give us 4x plus 30 equals 180. All right, we're going to subtract 30 from both sides. And we're going to get 150 is equal to 4x. Divide by 4. And x equals what? 37.5. Okay, so let's go back up to our originals, right? Angle 2 is equal to 3 times that. Did I? Yeah. 5x. 5x. Aha! Thank you very much. <sighs> I know, dude. I... <laughs> Just a bad day today. 5x. The key is not to have a day like this when you got to take a test, right? <laughs> All right, so this is equal to uh, 20. This is equal to 30, right? Yeah. Maybe we'll get a weighted day, maybe, one of our tests. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> no. So uh, angle two is equal to three times angle one, which is equal to three times 30, which is equal to 90. And then angle three is angle one plus 30. Uh, angle one plus 30. So x plus 30, which is equal to. 30 plus 30 equal to 16. So we have a triangle with 30, 60, and 90 degrees. Um, do we need to check that? Yes, we should, probably should. Yes, we should check it. Fine. OK. So well, actually, all, all we really need to do to, yeah, we could. Yeah, just plug it into the original if, if we want to check it. Um, so 5x plus 30, right? If x equals 30, and I believe we're good, right? Yeah. Okay. <sighs> all right. So, um, so luckily, I think for all of us, we're at the summary. Um, I mean, uh, yeah. If you struggle with applications, I do. Um, <laughs> make sure that you know the five steps well. And I'm not kidding either. Like, you know, when I was in these classes, I did struggle with applications, and I still do today. Uh, you know, you give me something abstract, and I'm super happy. You give me an application, and I'm just super sad. Um, so, yeah, uh, don't be afraid to come and get assistance on these guys, because they can be a pain. Um, 
if you have any particular type that you're having problems with, uh, you know, you can go ahead and let me know, and I can make some extra videos where I check my own work <laughs> uh, and put them up online, you know, just for some extra examples of those things. Um, all right, so one of the key factors in solving applications is recognizing the formula you're going to use. Some of them we use distance, some of them we use perimeters, some of them we use the angles of a triangle. Um, <clears throat> Let's see now. Uh, oh, and just like we saw in like the percent increase and decrease problems, we didn't see it that much because we only did two examples. But um, you know, you can break most of these problems down into specific cases so that you can kind of have an exact idea what to do in each case. Like the d equals r times t problem, that that really only breaks down into like maybe four or five different cases total. And so it's like you know, there aren't an infinite number of cases to memorize, just four or five. Um, yeah, and if you can recognize those, that'll be helpful. So that's it for today's class.